to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch by interviewing authors, discussing their books, learning about the writing process, and even, on occasion, chatting live with a panel of authors to discuss topics relevant to both readers and writers. My guest today on Online for Authors is Evelyn Puerto, author of the book, The Girl Who Broke the Dark, as well as the award-winning Outlawed Myth epic fantasy series. The Girl Who Broke the Dark is a story I simply could not put down. This fantasy, a twisted version of the fairy tale A Sleeping Beauty, had me wishing for more. And once again, I'm thrilled because it's just the first volume in what will become her Royal Madges series. Evelyn weaves a tale about Princess Eliana, her country, and a sleeping prince cursed by the evil sorcerer Cetus. Although she remains unaware of her role until her 18th birthday, Eliana is destined to break the curse or watch her country, and eventually the entire continent, fall victim to Cetus. Unfortunately, to do what she must, Eliana must venture deep underground to face barbarians, monsters, and her own fears. I often struggle with fantasy because I get lost in the world building, non-human characters, and social and physical law differences. However, I loved, loved, loved The Girl Who Broke the Dark and am enthralled with the story. All right. Welcome today to Online for Authors, where we have author Evelyn Puerto, who has written The Girl Who Broke the Dark. Welcome, Evelyn. Well, thank you, Terry. I'm so glad to be here. I am super excited to have you. So before we get started, I mean, like really into it, let's give the listeners like the elevator speech as to what is this book about? The Girl Who Broke the Dark is a sleeping beauty retelling with a few deadly twists. <laughs> the princess is the one that has to go break the curse, not the prince. And when she finds him and breaks a curse, she finds out that that's just the beginning. Okay. Now, I want to be totally upfront. I am not normally a fantasy reader. And I met with Evelyn and we had lunch together and she was talking about her book. And I thought, I, okay, I'm going to give it a try. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to try things, but I tend not to like fantasy because the world building is so ginormous to me. And I have a hard time letting go of my reality in order to, to like fully immerse myself. But I loved this book. I absolutely loved it. So tell me a little bit about, like, how did you do that? How did you make it so that someone like me, who is not really into the whole world building aspect, fell in love with a book that definitely has its own world? Well, that's an interesting question. I didn't set out specifically writing for somebody who doesn't like fantasy, but what I tried to do in my world building is make it feel real. So make it feel consistent. So I try to have kind of norms or customs or rules, whatever you want to call it, so that people feel like they're actually operating within a world. And usually what I do also is I pick a culture and use that as my jumping off point. So in this one, Princess Eliana, her, her kingdom is loosely, and I say loosely, based off of ancient Greece. But that's some of the inspiration for it. And so by having some elements that may feel a little familiar to a reader, they have a point of reference. And then I can add in the magical and mystical on top of that. Right. So for me, I, I did. I felt almost like I was in a human world that had a few elements in it that that sent it over into fantasy. But I, I felt comfortable with it instead of right. feeling, I don't know, I, I often feel like I'm being 
very pulled out of the story as I try, and it's, it's my own issue. I recognize mm. that as a reader, but that as I try to grapple with things that seem very unfamiliar to me, and this story had enough in it that I felt very comfortable. But I think for those who love fantasy, there was there was ample fantasy. It isn't like you said, <laughs> okay, well, we're just going to you know dispense with that. It was mm-hmm. it was excellent. I absolutely love it. And Thank I can't you. wait for the second one. This one just barely came out, and I'm already asking <laughs> you, like, when is the next one? I need the next one. So, <laughs> <laughs> a few so reviewers this, are saying that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is book one of a series. But mm-hmm. you have another series. So. I- Real quickly, just tell us a little bit about that series as well. The other series is the Outlawed Myth series. And that one started when I started thinking about this idea of freedom and safety. And that was spurred by a random news story, which I won't go into. But I imagined a world that had traded all of their freedom for safety. And they had reasons for it. They had escaped a massive civil war. And they were not going to have that ever again. So everybody was going to be safe. Everybody was going to be the same. All everybody equal, and that, and they were just going to live their lives. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't really work out the no. way they intended. It never and, does. <laughs> you know, and I think even one of the characters says, you can't outlaw accidents. And that is certainly true. Um, one of the characters, the main character, starts to question things and starts to realize that a lot of what they told her was a lie. And her questioning and her rebellion sets off a whole series of events that takes all the way through the other books of the series. And how many books are in your series? In that the- one has four. Four books. All right. All right. Um, why fantasy, Evelyn? Why yeah. fantasy? Well, that's yeah, a- because because you seem to have some historical perspective, like like you know, like mm-hmm. you said, you base it off of, of Greece. And I believe the the other one that you wrote was kind of a, a Soviet Union mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of flair going on. Right. It, right. Right. So what what put you into the fantasy realm versus say the historical fiction realm? Well, that goes back to how I got started writing. I I had been a missionary in Russia, and during those years my home church would send a group to Ukraine and I would go down and meet them and be an extra interpreter and just help out in their medical clinic and camp, kids camp. And we met there, this amazing family whose father had been a Baptist pastor for 30 years during the Soviet Union. And he and the entire family suffered intense persecution for their faith, including the kids in school. And they had amazing stories about it. Well, when I returned to the States, this woman who'd been on one of those trips cornered me and said, you need to write a book about that family. And I said, no, I don't. I'm not a writer. And she said, oh, but you know the language, you know the culture, you know the people, you can write it in a way that will make Americans relate to it. And after a series of events, I finally submitted to this. I wrote the book. (laughs) And I found out I really enjoyed the process of of putting the pieces of the story together to make it flow, to make it sing, and and to really tell a good story. And then that book won an award. It won a Reader's Favorite Award. And I thought, well, maybe I can actually do this. But I'm going to fiction because this is too hard, trying to make sure all the details are right Right. and getting somebody else's life right. And I'm making up my own world with its own rules. And that's what we're doing. And so fantasy was it? Fantasy was it. And it's also a genre I love and I've always loved. So it just was a natural fit. All right. So I want to know a little bit more about the process of of writing a fantasy. You know, I'm historical fiction. Mm -hmm. I also currently am dabbling in a, you know, contemporary fiction. But the worlds are set. You know, in historical Mm -hmm. fiction, it's set. You go find out what happened in that period of time, and then you you've got your world. And of course, in my modern day, you know, fiction right now that I'm mm-hmm. writing, the world is set. It's right. set in today, and it is what it is. The process of world building in a in a story, how like I don't even know where you would start 
How do you, <laughs> like, what is the process behind all of that? Um, I can only tell you my process and it, well, that's, yeah, I, I, I recognize that <laughs> everyone has their own. And I, and it changes with every book. So generally, Generally, I've started with at least a story idea. So this one, I knew Sleeping Beauty turned on its head. And then I start thinking about the cultures. So that's where I got the ancient Greece idea. And, and it's kind of going back and forth because I was thinking, okay, Sleeping Beauty, turn it on its head. Is there any other story I can mash into this? And I found one about the two lovers chasing themselves chasing each other through an underground realm. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. So I added that. So then I had to think, okay, if Eliana's culture is Greece with all of its learning and academia, what are these underground people? And just randomly, I came across a book called Tales of the Narts. And it's kind of like myths and legends for the Assetian people who are in the Caucasus region near Armenia, Georgia, and those mm -hmm. countries. And the Narts were hilarious, They're just these nomadic warriors who are always stealing each other's cattle and having big parties and fighting monsters. And I thought, this is great. So I took some elements of their culture. Then the next big thing is, of course, the magic system. And I spent a lot of time on the magic system of thinking about what are the rules? Because if you think of Harry Potter... There's not a lot of rules to that. They wave their wand and they say their spell and stuff happens. Other people have very scientifically worked out magic systems in the back of their books and you can study it for weeks to figure it out. I tried to go somewhere in the middle to figure mm -hmm. out what am I what am I going to do that's a little bit different and what are the rules? And the big temptation is as you write the book and you want the magic to do something else, you keep wanting to change the rules. But <laughs> now, now that I have published the first book, I can't tinker right. with the rules too much. Right, right. So, yeah. So that's kind of the two big things is getting the culture, getting a world that people actually feel like they live in, and then getting the system of magic. And then also if there are magical beasts or, or other people. So I have an allusion to Water Fae and... In, late, in one of the later books, I have a dragon. So just figuring out those elements too. What they're going to do. So mm -hmm. you also have a map. I have I'm a map. Curious, I'm curious, is, is the map something you do early, early on? Or do you do the map later? Well, um, I don't know if you can see this. This version is, whoops, this version yeah. is done early on, my scribbles. Okay. And I spilled tea on it. It's not till I got close to the end of the first book did I send it to an artist to actually okay. make into an, a map. But yeah, the map changes over time. And actually, I had drafted the second book before I sent the map to him okay. because I was exploring more of the world. But yeah, it. Yeah, because the first book really doesn't go much beyond the borders of, mm -hmm. of where you know, she is to begin with. Right, right. You know, and then go it goes little, under. And then you go right. under, but you don't really get to see much of, mm -hmm. the, of her world. You hear about it a little bit. There's right. There's a few references to a few places, but you don't really see it. So mm -hmm. yeah, I was just curious, like, like, are you writing along and you decide to add another, oh, I need an island. Oh, well, I could put the island here. Or have you already, <laughs> have you already got the island and you knew you were going to use it? Um, that's yes and no. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> So sometimes I'm writing, a, like I knew that Eliana's country was on the seashore. So I had mm -hmm. that. I knew that another country was adjacent to it. I knew there were mountains. I knew there were some islands off to the west. And the rest of it, it just grew as I needed it to. Okay. Okay. So I was just curious how that worked. Because once again, as someone who is very steeped in real world, you know, my map is my map. Right. I mean, you know, if I'm writing about Ukraine, that's where we are. And, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing that could potentially change is in history, sometimes your your borders have changed a little right. bit. Generally speaking, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was just curious about yeah. that. Um, I think one of the things that I loved is that the book is very character driven. Mm -hmm. I love reading a story mm -hmm. with good, solid characters. Mm -hmm. And although this is a fantasy and although there was a lot of world building, 
I believe that you focused a lot on character arc. We mm -hmm. see her, we mm -hmm. see her really grow from mm -hmm. this kind of teenage, I don't know, almost rolling her eyes at, at everything her parents have ever done, kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. to recognizing who she is and what she has got to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And and not not even just because of uh, the fact that she's a princess, but she's she now takes it on. Like right. she she's not just a princess; she actually becomes a princess. I don't know if that right. makes if I'm making yeah. any sense, but she doesn't. It's not just in title only, right. you know. And you and you mm -hmm. see that change, and I really loved that about the story. Who's your favorite character in that book? In that book. Wow. Dark. Wow. So, yeah, sometimes it changes dep depending yeah. on who I'm writing. Yeah. Um, I do like Eliana. I've been working on the sequel, the, the sequel and the sequel to the sequel, which is much more Daria. And I'm really loving Daria. Shardana was so much fun. So much fun to write. She was just so contrarian and just so I loved her. <laughs> she was and she was very much inspired by the tales of the Narts. There was right. somebody like that in that. And she was just a lot of fun. She was a lot of fun. How do you balance the world building with the character development? Like you can go too far one way or the other, mm -hmm. especially in in your genre. Your mm -hmm. readers, the, the readers who are truly fantasy readers, are looking for the world building. That is mm -hmm. part of what they really want. But you did such a good job of doing both. Like, how do you balance that? I think it comes down to I, I do a lot of plotting before I start writing, actually. So I and again, this is, it changes with every book, but I kind of get a vague story idea going and I figured out my main, I figure out the main plot points and then I start developing scenes to have a scene list and what goes on in those scenes. And as I think through my character arc, I'm thinking about what in the world affects that or makes it harder for her or makes it easier it's for easier. her. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things with Eliana is she's scared of the dark. She yes. has no problem with heights, but she's scared of the dark and now she's to go underground. Right. And so that just ups her tension the whole time. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I just, I guess character stories resonate more with me. So I think that's why I build so much into my own work. I'm not as much driven by the action. In fact, yeah. if I'm watching a fantasy movie and they get into an action scene, that's when I walk away and get something to drink. That just doesn't do it for me. But I know that's the main thrill for a lot of people. I, like I said, I feel like you balanced this story so well that regardless of if you are a fantasy reader who, you know, loves good action, you have action. It's not that your story is lacking action because there is lots of good action. But I don't feel like we dwell there so long that I forget who the characters are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I think happens, like you said, in movies. I, too, am the one getting up and getting popcorn. It's like, let me know when they're done shooting one another and who, <laughs> who came out the other side of that and then we'll go back to it. Yeah. And, and I just felt like you have such a good balance so mm -hmm. that that any reader, pretty much of, of, I would say, almost any genre would enjoy this story because you're going to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. There is there is the world building but there is the character development. There is the action. You know, I just, I don't know. I was, I was really, I think that, that I went into this thinking, well, I'm going to read it because Evelyn and I have met and I want very much to support her and I'm going to read this book and, and I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> you know, and I walked away going, oh my gosh. I mean, I have, I've recommended it to several people that I know that are fantasy readers. Oh, thank have you. you. <laughs> have you heard of Evelyn Porto? You've got to read this book. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled. I think this is, I, I, I'm wondering what I feel the same way about your first series. Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah. You might, I, I don't, 
since it was my first series, I'm going to say it's not as, um, my writing, I, I like to think my writing has gotten better <laughs> since we, I, I, I think we all evolve as we write right. without a doubt. Yeah. The, that one, um, the magic wasn't as thought out. That was a much more nebulous magic system. And it, it did, as you said, had that Soviet Union dystopian vibe to it. Mm -hmm. there, it was much more of a political fantasy, I'd say. And, okay. the, and with a Romeo and Juliet subplot. And yeah, so you might, you might really there. And there is a lot of character development to it. Yeah. I, yeah. I did. I did put that in. So that's kind of a long answer to your question. Well, no, no, I, I love that. So your writing process, mm -hmm. you're definitely more of a plotter than a panster. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and we had this discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm more the other way around. Mm -hmm. Although I am trying to to plot a little in the book that I'm currently writing. And I, I kind of... I've kind of liked it because I'm trying something so very different than mm -hmm. I've ever done before that, that having guardrails up kind of feels, right. kind of feels nice. Like, okay, yeah. I can't get too far off mm -hmm. the reservation mm -hmm. here. I kind yeah. of know, but I'm still very much a pantster in that I have a vague notion of mm -hmm. where I'm going, but I, I don't know. It just kind of like comes to me in spurts as I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Do you have that too? Despite putting things out, you know, plotting it out. Mm -hmm. Do you have those moments where you're writing and things kind of like take over? Oh, absolutely. And I can okay. give you an example. Okay. So I'm in the middle of the first draft of the sequel to the sequel of the girl who broke the dark. Uh -huh. And I, so I have plotted not just my main plot points, I have a scene list. And then once I have my scene list, I kind of figured out, okay, this is kind of how it's going to go down. And then each scene, I write a scene outline, just kind of what, what complications happened and what's the big turn in the, what's the big turn in the scene, right. scene? Like, what's the point of it? Right. Why are we even here? Right. Why are we doing this? And it, and sometimes a lot of my scenes that I had on my scene list, like, nope, that one can be combined with that because there's nothing... It's There's not nothing doing, really happening here. It's not right. doing enough. Or these five together, that's a thing. But separately, they're not. Then I start writing. So last week, for example, my husband was on a business trip, and I pounded out 23,000 words following my plot. But that happened because the scene list that I, and the scene outlines worked. Now, this week, it has not been that way. <laughs> And I, I start my scene and I'm like, I don't like this. Or why is this so hard? Why is this not flowing? And some of those scenes that I had outlined have taken a completely different turn. And that's okay because having had the scene outline, it's a starting point for my thoughts. I don't have to sit down and say, okay, what were these people doing? Oh yeah, this is what I wanted them to do. I start writing, not working. Let's go on to something else. And the do other... Do you feel like your characters are telling you that? Sometimes I swear my characters are like, I know what you think you're doing, but <laughs> we're not going there. And I, so you're going to have stupor of thought until you give in and let us go where we think we're going. Because Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah. Just okay. the scene I was working on yesterday, one of the characters kind of took over the dialogue and I'm like, oh, I kind of like this. This is better yeah. than what I thought, but <laughs> where did this come from? Yeah. And the other thing I have to say is I don't do a lot of, character development before I write. So I have figured out, I usually have figured out what the arc is and maybe a few things about the person like Princess Daria. She loves to shock people. That's her thing. Yeah. But I've seen people do these character questionnaires like what is their favorite way to receive mail and what would be their pet is like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. So I'm discovery writing the characters and filling in their personalities. And that too, sometimes my scene outline goes right out the window. Right, because, because the, now it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit who that person is right. now. And then I get to the end and I have to remember, okay, go back to the beginning because she was this way in the beginning and she's no longer that person. Right. But that's right. okay. It's part of the process. Right. I do that. I'll do that too in terms of character where I realize oh, she's more this way. And 
I'll, I'll make little notes. I, I have, mm. I keep a notebook next to me and it's like, you know, go back to the beginning and make sure that you add some things mm-hmm. that will let people understand, you know, who she mm-hmm. is from the beginning or, or I came up with this idea with, with one of them where I needed, I needed the Italian number 17 is like our 13. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. But I needed it to be 17 and it was going to work beautifully, but I needed a reason for her to have it. Her grandfather needed to be Italian. And so I had to write a little note you know, add in grandfather was Italian and, and I could do it in a sentence earlier on, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it needed to be said because otherwise, why would she have an Italian superstition? Right. Right. You know, it was something that her grandfather told her when she was mm-hmm. a kid and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting how, how you're writing and it's like, Oh, Oh, I have things I have to, <laughs> in the beginning, <laughs> a couple <laughs> things have to change here. <laughs> right. Right. So you have written, you, you said that you wrote a true story. Mm -hmm. And um, I also saw that you have an anthology of short stories. I'm in that anthology. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got your uh, first series. Now Mm -hmm. you're writing the second series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other projects do you think that you have in your future? Have you thought beyond what you're doing right now? Yes, and I'm I'm wondering if I'm making myself crazy. But I have a couple projects. One is I started writing some short stories about my characters in The Girl Who Broke the Dark. Mm-hmm. And I have four of them kind of done. And then there were a couple scenes that I actually wrote and decided they don't really I don't really want to include them in the novel. Right. But they'll make a good short story about this other person. So I'm thinking of expanding all of that to maybe a collection of eight short stories and mm-hmm. making that a companion volume. And I'll tell you, the benefit of doing these short stories about the character's backstory is it really fleshed that out so that when I referred to it, I had you know relatives names and I had all this stuff figured out. And that just flowed right in when it was time to plop it into the yeah. novel. So that's one little project. And then another one, and this is the one that has me banging my head against the wall. About six or seven years ago, I wrote this book that was supposed to be a novella. I was going to give it away for free, but it grew up into a full length novel. (laughs) So I was like, all right, I don't know what I want to do with this. Um, And the feedback I got was really frustrating because there wasn't a really coherent theme to the feedback. So I didn't know what to do with it. And there were a lot of people kind of said that it was the best thing I'd written at that time. And so I've been tinkering with it for six years. And I tried getting a manuscript evaluation and the woman had weird feedback. And anyway, it was just on and on. Beta readers were contradictory. So I'm trying again, I'm gonna send it to another editor, but I'm thinking if I can make this thing work because it's most of the way done, hopefully it just needs some tweaking, then that would be the start of another series that I could have in the works. Fantastic. And it too is fantasy. It's also fantasy, but that one is set um, here. So it's more urban fantasy. Okay. Okay. Do you have any thoughts of ever not doing fantasy, of doing something else completely? Every now and then I think about historical fiction because that's, that's a genre I love. I've also loved a mystery, mm-hmm. but I look at some of those plots and I think, I don't know that I would be that clever to come up with something <laughs> that nobody would guess. And although people tell me my twists and turns take them by surprise, yes, so maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I could do it. I don't yeah. know, but that's another one that I've, I've contemplated. But yeah. The reason that I asked is because, you know, I, I told you when we had lunch together mm-hmm. that I think I'm committing uh, author suicide by, uh, you know, I, I've done three historical fiction. So mm-hmm. my third's coming out and then I'm like totally changing up. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going from third person past tense with, with three different points of view to first person present tense, one point of view from, I, it's just very different, but I, I don't know. I, as an author wanted to try something different. I just mm-hmm. felt and I think I'll probably go back and do more historical fiction. I don't think I'm changing 
really Mm -hmm. my love. I just felt like, I don't know, like I needed something to cleanse my palate, you know, like, like adding lemon after. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Who knows? You could be onto something. Yeah. I don't know. I just think that, that it's, it's unusual. It's a very different way of writing. And I think sometimes maybe that's good because it makes Mm -hmm. you stop and really evaluate your process and Mm -hmm. think, think a little more about your character development because this is so different than what you've had to mm-hmm. do before. So yeah, I kind of like that idea. Yeah. That one I've been banging my head up against the wall on that one's in first person point of view. And that was a whole different right. avenue for me. And you have to really think about how you're informing the reader of what's going on much differently than when you're in third person. Yes. Third person to me now that I'm writing in first person, third person almost feels like cheating because you can do so much. You know what I'm saying? You have the ability to, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of be omniscient and, and just, you know, here we are and here are things mm-hmm. you need to know. And and in yeah. this first person, it's, yeah, it's a little more, it's tricky. It's tricky. It, it's it tricky. is tricky. And I'm enjoying, the, I, mm-hmm. I think for me, it's more of a challenge. I'm just enjoying the challenge of trying to do something so different. That, and um, my middle daughter is my critic. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, so how many books are you going to write that are, you know, three points of view, generational three points of view? How many? Don't you don't you think it's a little bit of a crutch? Oh, interesting. And I thought maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> you do maybe, get, yeah. Maybe, well, you get used to like with three points of view like that, and they're different generations. The viewpoints become very they're, they're very obvious. You mm-hmm. have someone who's who's lived through the historical event and then you have this granddaughter who's only heard about it right right and then you have that middle one who Mm -hmm. who kind of has more memory but you know what I'm saying and so Mm -hmm. it's easy to to have these different points of view and I thought maybe she's right maybe maybe there is something to that so yeah I'm doing the whole big change so (laughs) yeah (laughs) But but you've made some changes your first series your books Mm -hmm. each book was longer than the girl who broke the dark is that true that's true um yeah I feel like I got carried away on them (laughs) and and it just I really made a deliberate choice to do the girl who broke the dark a little bit shorter to make the story tighter Mm -hmm. and also I did find that as I went on in the series especially at the end to wrap everything up that one became 124,000 words. So to give myself room to grow into it, I made The Girl Who Broke the Dark a little shorter. Now, it came in at 100,000 words. So it, it's not a novella by any stretch right. of the imagination. Right. But I did try to make it shorter. Would you say that this is a young adult fantasy? Are you Are you pushing it that way? Or are you... What makes a book young adult? versus or is that like is that like asking what makes historical fiction and everyone has their own definition that you know that's the million dollar question my understanding is that if you go to a library or a young adult means the protagonists and the main characters are young adults that that's the age of the person which does not mean it is literature appropriate for young adults age 12 to 18 or would not be of interest to anybody older and that's where it's confusing so i think i'm not billing it as young adult i'm just billing it as epic fantasy and letting the chips fall where they may the first series i build as young adult and it was kind of because They said, I read somewhere, young adult is the hot market, so get into it. (laughs) And I don't know if that helped or hurt because there are, there's an upside and a downside to it. So anyway, yeah, I'm writing young adult fiction in that that's the age of the protagonist, but I really don't feel that's my target audience. And who is your target audience? 
That's another good one. I think it's women. I think more of my sales are women. From what I can tell, more of my newsletter subscribers are women. Mm -hmm. But some of my most rave reviews have come from men. And I have a couple men on my list that they just cannot wait till the next thing I write comes out. So I'm not 100% sure. I can say I think they are older people. Yes. 30s, 40s, 50s. I think that's the age that I'm connecting with. I and, and I feel the same way. People ask me that question. I have the same problem, which is I thought that I was writing to women who were 40 plus. Mm -hmm. That's who I would have said my my. And I do. And like you, I would say I have quite a few people in my newsletter that do fit that. Mm -hmm. But I also have quite a few people who do not. Right. You know, and it's like so you know, the, the advice is you can't write to everyone, right? which I think is true. But on the other hand, there's no reason to really limit it. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. just because I think I'm writing to women who are 40 and older doesn't mean that a man who's 20 might not enjoy it. That's right. You That's know? right. And so, yeah, it's it. It's a, the whole the whole picking what actual genre you are, because you know, fantasy, there's more than just fantasy. Like right. you said, there's mm -hmm. urban fantasy, epic fantasy, young adult fantasy. I'm sure there are others. Like, I think, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm choking here. <coughs> there's all kinds of them. There's fairy tale retellings. There is, you mentioned urban, there's epic, there's sword and sorcery. There's a whole subgenre that's just dragons. That's a thing. Right. Then there is another subgenre, which I don't particularly get into, where the characters are not human and they're not your standard elves and dwarves and what you would think. They're like half human, half animal, or montages right. of magic, magical beasts. Maybe that's the way to call it. So, yeah, there's all of that. And then there's yeah. the whole paranormal with shapeshifters like werewolves and vampires and all of that. Right, right. So there's just it's it's a it's a very wide genre. And mm -hmm. then trying to like find your niche and your readers. Um, and I think that's true of any author is trying to mm -hmm. figure out like this is this is what I'm writing. And now you're making me name it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't make me put a label on it, please. Yeah, it's really please. hard. It's really hard. So Let's talk the title just for a minute. The mm -hmm. girl who broke the dark was, did that come to you easily or are titles hard for you? Like they are for me. Titles for the first series was agony. Yes. I had yes. a list for the book that was, that's the first that became the, became flight of the spark. I had a list, no lie, 106 candidates. <laughs> And I agonized that over that. I, I think I even sent it out to some people and said, what do you think? I talked to my editor about it. She had different ideas. Finally came up with Flight of the Spark. Once I had that, the rest of the series was easier because I just riffed off of right. that syntax. The Girl Who Broke the Dark, that one I think just came to me. I was trying to think about, you know, what did she do with her magic? And she breaks this, this dark spell and... So it just kind of came to me and there's a lot, a lot of books have the girl who did whatever. Yes, thought, right, well, we'll, right. we'll just add one more to the pile. What the hey? Yeah. I, uh, with sunflowers beneath the snow that went back and forth so many times between me and my editor that I was sure the book was going to be called you name it by Terry <laughs> Ann Brown. I mean, I, I, I just, Oh, yeah, titles are not my strong mm -hmm. suit. In fact, I've already been talking to my publisher about book number four. And one of her first things she said to me is, is, well, what's the working title? And I wrote back, ha, huh, aren't you funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's right. like working title. I picked one of the characters' names. That's how I save it in my computer. There mm. is no working title. Oh, like, my I, working title is novel number seven. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and I refer to it all the time as, yeah, my fourth manuscript. That's yeah, the one. That's, that's you the know. one. So, yeah. So you, you and I have that in common anyway. I think it's interesting. Some people, I was uh, reading in a group the other day where someone has already come up with a title and a cover and they've not even started writing yet. Oh, yes. I've heard of people doing that. I and can't I'm imagine. Like, oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, like that's <laughs> so foreign to me because mm -hmm. cover picking is also difficult. Yeah. How how did how did that go for you this time with with picking the cover for the girl who broke the dark? Well, I um, going back to the first series, I used two different designers till I came up with the studio that I use, and they're just brilliant. I just give them a few ideas and they take it. So with the girl who broke the dark, I said, I want to use a more object based thing with the fantasy trope elements. And, and they came up with some stuff. We went back and forth a couple of times. So we settled on what we have. Well, it's beautiful. Well, thank you. It, it is very, it is, it's definitely interesting. You know, it's one of those that I'd say, Oh, oh I would, I'd like to look at that. Yeah, so it, it really Great. good. You did it. You did a good job with it. Um, yeah, but I, I have the same thing. It's it's kind of back and forth, you mm -hmm. know, where you look and and it's like, yeah, well, that's close, but not really. What if could we do this or could we add? Mm -hmm. um, I think that they might get tired of me because I'll say, can we try adding this? And they do, and it's like, no, I don't like that after all. Yeah. <laughs> Well, on one of my books, The Sting of the Scorpion, I kept saying, where's the scorpion? And they, you know, we were going back and forth. It's there. It's there. I was looking in the wrong place. I mean, I didn't even notice it at the bottom. Yes. Oh, yeah. sorry. Sorry. Oh, never you mind. Guys are right. I, yeah, I get I it now. I see it now. Yeah. Well, they, um, for Daughters of Green Mountain Gap, it, I was given several covers to choose from um, initially. And it took one of my readers seeing my covers to say, oh, well, the mountains are the um, silhouettes of the women. You can oh. see that. And I looked at it was like, holy beans, would you look at that? <laughs> I just saw mountains. Oh, you didn't see that. Oh, interesting. And so yeah, it is interesting what people see mm -hmm. in a cover and what they don't see. Right. You know, right. like I put a lot of effort into an enemy like me. He, you see his reflection, but mm -hmm. what people don't recognize, and I have to point out, is that he's wearing an American uniform, but in the reflection, he's wearing a German uniform. Oh, interesting. Because he's more like the enemy than he is mm -hmm. different. He recognizes mm -hmm. that, and and people don't see it. And to me, it's like this huge element, and I have to point it out, and they're like, oh. Whoa. <laughs> and I think I would have had to do the same thing with with those faces if I had gone that way. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. honestly, I mean, I've been looking at it for days. I never saw it. Oh, that's and then I funny. had a reader and I had a reader that say, I kind of really like funny. the idea. And it was like, oh my gosh, I had not seen <laughs> it at all. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah, it is. Is there anything that you wish that I had asked you that I did not ask that you would just love to tell people about you or your books or your process or anything? Well, if they are interested in finding out more about my work, I have a website, evelynpuerto.com. And if they want to sign up for my newsletter and to hear about all the stuff that's going on and new releases and every now and then I have gift card giveaways and fun stuff they can go to subscribe.evelynpuerto.com. Fantastic. And I'll have that in the show notes. So Evelyn, thank you. Thank you for being here. I have really enjoyed talking with you and I'm sure that my listeners are going to enjoy hearing all about the girl who broke the dark. Well, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun, Terry. It was great to talk to you again. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.